Welcome to the uh, Association for Diplomatic uh, Studies and Trainings uh, Virtual Diplomatic Lunch Discussion Series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Rincon. I'm an active duty uh, foreign service officer here with ADST and I'll serve as a moderator today. As part of ADST's mission to capture, preserve and share the history of America's diplomats, this series features policy experts and authors who have a connection with us. In fact, today's speaker is in the final stages of publishing his own oral history. So we invite you to learn more, support our efforts, and sign up to preserve your own oral history at adst.org. So today, we're incredibly pleased to have uh, Ambassador Luigi Ainaudi with us, who, as I understand it, grew up in the shadows of a family legacy steeped in education, international affairs, and I suspect that helped shape him into the person he is today. He served a long and distinguished career uh, diplomatically. He retired from the State Department in July of 1997 after serving eight years on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, 12 years as the Director of Policy Planning for the Bureau of uh, Inter-American Affairs, now known as Western Hemisphere Affairs, and four years as the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for American States. He was then the U.S. Special Envoy in the peace talks that led to a comprehensive settlement of the centuries-old territorial boundary conflict between Ecuador and Peru. So as ambassador to the OAS, uh, Dr. Ainaudi developed initiatives to support democracy and increase trade. He's received numerous awards from various U.S. presidents, political leaders, foreign heads of state alike for his numerous achievements. And he's also the principal author of the book, Beyond Cuba, Latin America Takes Charge of Its Future. He's an educator, a storyteller, and we're thrilled that he's here with us today. So perhaps in that vein, uh, we look forward to hearing him uh, talk a little bit about how the lessons he learned from his forebears helped him advance U.S. interests in Latin America and in the Caribbean. So I'm sure we're, we're in for an insightful discussion, and I'd allow, like to invite uh, Ambassador Ainaudi to open the conversation. Doctor, por favor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the ADST and its efforts. I am still, in fact, rather belatedly completing my own oral history at this point. Um, a lot has changed in our lifetimes. Um, in the 1950s, uh, when I was in college, fewer than 10 million persons in the US were foreign born. And most of them came from Italy, Germany, Canada, the UK, um, even Poland and Russia who outnumbered those who were born in Mexico. Today, according to the latest census figures, 44 million persons who are foreign born live in the United States. And no European country is in the top 10. 12 million are from Mexico, followed by India and China. And when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, the National Student Association had to send somebody to Chile for a meeting. They couldn't find a single student activist who could speak Spanish. And so somebody said, well, send Ainaudi, he at least speaks Italian. Well, I went in 1955. And in fact, my Italian proved quite useful because um, I found few people in Chile, Argentina, Uruguay who could um, speak uh, much English. Uh, today, it is rare to find a leader, even in deeper South America, that cannot speak at least some English. So will the future bring similar changes? Um, a wise man said that we shouldn't talk about the future when we have so much trouble predicting the present. Um, but let me try starting with the present. 80% of the people of Latin America now live in cities. Population growth rates have dropped to half of what they were. Argentina, Brazil, and even Mexico are all now like us at non-replacement levels. Large middle and professional classes 
have undermined the traditional ruling triad of big landowners, church, and the military. Modern societies are simply too complicated to rule with bayonets. Castro and Chavez still evoke headlines, particularly, I suspect, in Florida. But they're both dead. The regional followers are in decline. Their countries depressed as well as declined. Democracy, however, has not proved a panacea. Institutional weaknesses, social injustice, and the scars of history breed corruption, political confrontations, and populism. Previously marginalized social classes and groups have entered the modern economy, driving domestic economic growth. But the COVID pandemic is now accentuating deep inequities there as well as here. Major economic convulsions are predicted with downturns expected maybe twice as much as that of the United States. All this said, the 35 very different countries of the Americas are well, um, very different. Uh, Brazil has long seen itself separate from its Spanish speaking neighbors. When in, nine, when in 1808, the Portuguese court moved to Brazil to escape the polio, they brought with them the seat of empire with possessions in Africa and Asia uh, and a sense of global reach that lasts to this day, giving Brazil a sense of the frontier and of national destiny that rivals that of the United States. The countries along South America's Andean spine have large Indian populations that are a living memory of the Inca empire and explain why some argue the entire region should be called Indo-America rather than the conquerors of Latin America. Like California, their shores are lapped by the Pacific Ocean, which creates an increasingly manageable link to China. The Caribbean is part of us. I learned that from Andrew Young. I accompanied him on a tour of the Caribbean in 1977 uh, when he was UN ambassador. And when we got to Barbados, he told me that after the death of Martin Luther King, he and other civil rights leaders had gone to Barbados to recover. Everyone there was black, from the garbage man to the prime minister made it possible to be normal, he said, to forget about the pain of being black in the United States. It's small island states know that security is multidimensional, including climate and health, as well as policing. Rising waters affect them just as much as New York's Battery Park or Florida, Southern Florida. The Bahamas is 80%, only three feet or less above sea level. In 1750, the value of exports from Saint-Domingue, which was today's Haiti in the Dominican Republic, was greater than the combined exports of all 13 colonies in what was to become the United States. That included 60% of the world's coffee and 40% of the sugar. When I was in college, the countries of the Commonwealth Caribbean were still colonies. Independence now has not kept them from being devastated by the travel restrictions of the coronavirus pandemic. Haiti in 1804, became the world's first black republic. Today, it is the poorest country in the hemisphere and our ties to it, I think, are a mockery of our pretensions. 
A century ago, the countries of Central America would put the letters CA on the bottom of their stamps to make sure that foreigners would understand where their letters were coming from. Today, Central America has survived the collapse of the traditional order uh, ended by the Cold War, but still face the pangs of modernization amid the ravages of climate change. The Maya civilization was extinguished by drought, people now think, and that may be what is happening now with the Corredor Seco, which is driving migration to the United States. And then there's Mexico. Like Canada and the Caribbean Basin, Mexico is increasingly integrated with the United States, but Mexico remains unique in spirit and culture. This year is the 500th anniversary of the Spanish conquest and the 200th anniversary of Mexico's independence from Spain. This said, the Mexican government knows it is closer to the United States than to God. This fact sets the table for its official calculation. More on that later. But first, let me turn to the Americas as a whole. The charter of the Organization of American States asserts that, and I quote, the historic mission of America is to offer to man a land of liberty, unquote. This lofty evocation of the ideal of the new world in contrast to old Europe has never managed to be brought to earth. The closest we came was perhaps in 1991, when seeking to consolidate the wave of democratic transitions that had ended dictatorships, OAS Resolution 1080 called for collective pressure against undemocratic actions. That resolution also called for incentives strengthen democratic systems based on regional solidarity. I quote from the resolution. Today, 30 years later, there is little solidarity and no multilateral support for institutional development. Domestic arrangements, it's true, like effective public administration, public education, human resources, or organizational forms uh, such as electoral systems um, and independent judicial systems uh, and the free press um, cannot, as a rule, be imposed from the outside. But nonpartisan international support can strengthen local institutions and help deter violations. I am convinced that Venezuela's slide into tragedy today's really deep population expelling misery could have been avoided by an effective multilateral support system with incentives as well as sanctions as once intended. Instead, Venezuela's evolution has split OAS members into intractable camps, arguing over both the meaning of democracy and weakening uh, the OAS. Perhaps the problem goes back to independence. The 13 former British colonies of North America came together and have managed to stay together as the United States. To their south, a smaller number of Spanish territories fragmented into an even greater number of independent states. A century later, one thinker wrote that independence had, and I quote, turned the history of each of our countries into the anti-history of its neighbors. Certainly visions of a common future have not prospered. Many of our neighbors view the United States as self-interested and unreliable, a gulliver focused on extending and legitimizing its power. U.S. leaders reciprocate seeing their neighbors 
our neighbors as the Laputians, using multilateralism as a form of trade unionism of the weak. Asymmetries in power and perception make cooperation difficult. The overwhelming concentration of wealth in the United States is an unspoken major obstacle. In 1974, Henry Kissinger convened the hemispheres representatives in Tlatelolco in Mexico. And he preached the need for community. Sonny Ramphal, the foreign minister of Guyana responded, but sir, have you forgotten that Aristotle taught that community among unequals is impossible. From a global perspective, Latin America was long described as part of the US backyard. The history of US foreign policy, in fact, before World War II was almost exclusively the history of US interventions, whether it was in Haiti, Panama, Cuba, or Nicaragua. And few realize today that the Rio Treaty was the predecessor, the model for the Article 5 uh, attack on one is an attack on all provision of NATO. After the Western Hemisphere ideal faded, it was replaced by visions of the third world. I still remember elites down there complaining to me that the US treats us as if we were the third world. Che Guevara answered that one. He said, we are the third world. But then it became apparent that the third world didn't exist either. Then the BRICS and South-South were toted, touted as um, new forces. And now for all of the talk of the rise of the rest, trying to place countries in a new global order is increasingly difficult. When the UN was founded in 1945, the Americas accounted for 20 of its 50 votes. With the independence of the Commonwealth Caribbean, that number 20 went up to 34. But in the meantime, the UN now has 193 members. For Brazil, Chile, and Peru, China, has replaced the United States as their largest market, buying raw materials and food and making multi-billion dollar investments in Brazil's electrical system, in a mega, mega port in Shanghai in Peru. And after 20 years of trial and error, China is learning to operate in this hemisphere. Importantly, it's in taking advantage of multilateral instruments like the WHO. Now, China's COVID diplomacy obviously has weaknesses, but the scandalous US treatment of the Pan American Health Organization can make even Sinovac look heavenly. The coronavirus pandemic comes on top of a perfect storm global stresses, demographics, the environment and climate change, inequality, cultural and racial identities, fueling global disorder and huge uncertainty about the future. With borders closed and travel limited, everyone is too busy at home think about crises elsewhere. Globalization is in crisis. Some decoupling, I think, economically seems likely, as does some increased regionalism. In Asia, China's Silk Road and the Asian Development Bank. In Europe, where the EU Recovery Fund has given new life, um, to disappointing levels of unity, um, perhaps even in Africa. 
and we must not overlook potential here in the Americas. The recent U.S. presidential campaigns focus on Venezuela and Cuba belie the vital importance of Mexico to the United States. Our single most important trading partner, Mexico was repeatedly slandered during the 2016 presidential campaign. Then candidate Trump's talk of disease bearing murderers and rapists reminded me of the Middle Ages. Talk of the beautiful wall obscured the fact that the big wall building push had happened a decade earlier. Deportations had reached all time highs in the Obama administration. And moreover, for some time, more non-Mexicans than Mexicans, mainly but not exclusively Central America, were trying to reach us through Mexico. But they've not always gotten in. Even Mexico's populist president, Love Miguel Lopez Obrador, has deployed Mexico's National Guard to keep migrants out. Calculation, perhaps more of necessity than of choice, but a fact nonetheless. Now missed in all this noise is also the fact that North America could be a key to reducing our dependence on China. Like the US, Mexico has lost thousands of jobs and hundreds of factories to China. But with supportive policies, could become part of the consolidation of sensitive supply chains important to our national security. The US has done little to control illegal money flows and nothing to stop the flow, the iron river of weapons that fuel Mexico's drug violence, many of which come through China to the US middlemen in California and Texas. Yet Mexico's cooperation with the United States on most issues is still so close as to be embarrassing to most Mexicans. Perhaps it's time to rediscover Mexico and to stop thinking of Canada as just another state to our north. North America matters. Peace on our borders has long been fundamental to US security and to the US capacity to project its power elsewhere in the world. We, the United States, are scheduled to host the next summit of the Americas later this year. Canada, Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean, even Northern South America are part of the magnetic pole created by the wealth and dynamism of the United States. The Caribbean basin, broadly defined to include the Caribbean islands, meaning Cuba, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, as well as the Commonwealth Caribbean, plus Mexico, Central America, and in South America, Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, and Suriname should all be engaged multilaterally, if not bilaterally, in a cooperative development challenge to manage climate change, migration, security, and regional development. The Reagan administration's Caribbean Basin Initiative should be built back better and with a clearer multilateral component. In the Americas as a whole, the bilateral trade arrangements just negotiated with Brazil should be expanded, perhaps with a rethinking of the TPP and a focus on better defining where China is an adversary to be resisted, but also where it is a competitor to be met. I'm not saying that the US or any of the other countries must choose between regionalism and globalism. 
I was the ambassador when the first President Bush used the OAS as the venue to sign the first NAFTA agreement. As inevitably happens whenever an ambassador is accompanying his president, I became something of a protocol officer and spent much of my time escorting U.S. businessmen invited to the ceremony. And I well remember two of them complaining unhappily to each other that they didn't want to be limited to North America, that their interests were global. I believe that's a foul, false choice. Power starts at home and builds outward. The best regionalism is compatible with universalism. To make the future work for us, we must rethink sovereignty. A century ago, 1918, my grandfather wrote, and I quote, we must abolish the dogma of perfect sovereignty, the interdependence of free peoples, not their absolute independence is the truth. A state isolated and sovereign that can survive on its own is a fiction. It cannot be a reality. Reality is that states can be equal and independent among themselves only when they realize that their life and development will be impossible if they are not ready to help each other. Of course, our interests come first, but the parading of sovereignty, me firstism, and criticism of foreigners is nothing more than vitamins for bad politicians. In today's interdependent world, sovereignty's first line of defense is knowing how to work with others to advance our interests. The best way I have found to expl express that is engranaje, the Spanish for mutual engagement or a meshing of gears to make the world turn better than it would otherwise. Individual states can no longer retreat like Voltaire's Candide to cultivate their little separate gardens, to take care of ourselves, to advance our national interests we must also deal with the outside world. And all countries, small as well as large, large as well as small, must contribute their share. The Americas, starting with North America and the Caribbean Basin, and then extending beyond, are the natural foundation for the prosperity of the United States. Learning to cooperate with others without sacrificing sovereignty, is as much an insurance policy for progress as anything else we can do. Thank you very much. And I hope that that stimulates some discussion. Thank you very much, Ambassador, Professor, really for those uh, comprehensive thoughts. We have a number of uh, very interesting questions that have been sparked by your presentation. So if I might, I'd like to turn to uh, an insightful, we have a number of questions about Venezuela. And Earl Carr, in particular, is asking uh, if you could address the following. How do you see the political situation uh, to the, or evolving in Venezuela? It's a quagmire. Do you see a solution? And do you see either Maduro or Guaido ultimately consolidating power, especially in light of the, the recent elections and the parliamentary elections in December, which have uh, really strengthened Maduro's administration? You, you talked about solving problems, the inner, we're interdependent, that we need to be together. How might that apply to Venezuela in this situation? Well, I'm uh, an old man and I can't be expected to follow day-to-day uh, -day developments um, in Venezuela uh, closely. Uh, my sense very strongly is uh, that the situation uh, in Venezuela really is a morass um, that 
unfortunately, uh, for many years, I think Venezuela was a country that uh, it's an example of a country destroyed by, by the easy wealth of black gold, of petroleum, which made it possible to uh, disregard one's own balanced development. As long as, when I was in college, I discovered that I had a friend who made a lively, whose father made a livelihood selling eggs to Venezuela from Florida. I, that is not a balanced, integrated situation. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, um, Venezuelan leaders, including uh, my friend Carlos Andres Perez, who made major contributions, um, wound up dying in the United States, unable to return because Chavez wouldn't let him back, because really he like Chavez, had followed his own star without thinking in terms of what was good for the development of Venezuela. And what has now happened in that country is really extraordinarily depressing because with the emigration and loss of enormous amounts of its educated classes, with the undermining of uh, political groups and with a, uh, an attempt now really basically to um, support power on the basis of coercion. It's not even really the military alone anymore. The military has been counterbalanced. In the old days, it was the National Guard counterbalancing the military. Now it's uh, various armed popular groups uh, you really have a, uh, a sinking into a mire of ineffectiveness, ineffectiveness of the government, ineffectiveness of the opposition, and inability to control things, uh, and an increasing burden on uh, the neighbors. Now, uh, you may have mentioned that I was the U.S. envoy in the Peripetal War. Um, and that was a crisis that a lot of people thought would never end and would never be solved. We did solve it. We solved it basically by taking an impossible situation and merging it into a broader one, where instead of having a lose-lose war over land, you had a win-win victory that dealt with development, navigation, and all kinds of other matters. Venezuela today is intractable. So has Cuba proved intractable for 60 years. And the intractability has benefited nobody, neither the Cubans, nor the Americans, nor the Latin Americans, nor the Venezuelans. I suspect that if we take this lesson, if you want to solve an intractable problem, make it part of a bigger problem. And that's why in effect, I talk about the need to revisit the Caribbean Basin Initiative. Slowly, gradually, one can uh, begin to deal with the destabilizing effects of migration with the problems of illegal arms flows, with the problems of institutional development, of strengthening judicial systems and the press, with improving education, with start both simply with questions of food and health uh, and development. Uh, and gradually, bit by bit, fragmentation can be turned into the coalescence around things that work. But I'm talking about patience. I'm talking about seeing the benefits of a long-term commitment over time. I'm not talking about favoring uh, any particular political leader 
or partisan solution? Thank you. No, that's a good answer. There are a number of questions to follow on, on along those lines that uh, maybe identify, is there a credibility gap when it comes to, and you have a long experience at the OAS and of course representing the United States, but as inter interlocutors, uh, how does one overcome this potential credibility gap that may exist with, with Latin American interlocutors? And I think the questions are coming from uh, the point of view, uh, for example, one from uh, Abby Golden Vasquez asks, what might it take for the United States to see the opportunities and possibilities of prioritizing uh, Latin American countries in accordance with their real economic and potential, uh, their, their political relevance as our hemispheric neighbors? In other words, uh, how does one overcome uh, the, the the, the credibility gap that may exist of the United States telling others how to do things in the world. What might you say? Yes, I, I think the, uh, we should not exaggerate the importance um, to the universe uh, of the world, uh, of Latin America to the world. Um, you know, uh, one of the latest uh, big spurts was when everybody thought Brazil was going to be a big uh, power and then suddenly um, it proved to be something of a flash in the pan. Um, Short-term thinking doesn't work. Um, Latin America is not the key to running the world. Uh, but Latin American countries are our neighbors and neighbors do not go away. Geography matters. Also, they're not stupid neighbors, and they know that we don't pay much attention to them or know much of their history. So the issue is not that suddenly the United States is going to stand on its head and change uh, everything it does. Uh, and as I said before earlier already, I think the question of credibility um, is a a question of patience, of time. Trust takes a long time to build. But let's be very practical. As I said, these are smart people. They know they're our neighbors and they can tell when we take them seriously and when we don't. Uh, let me just make a suggestion. A friend of mine um, recently uh, suggested this, um, a Blowenthal. Uh, that perhaps one of the first things that Kerry could do uh, would be to consult uh, on climate change with Latin America. Not a question of saying uh, Latin America is more important than other parts of the world, just a question of saying we understand we have neighbors who are also suffering severely from the ravages of um, hurricanes, sea rise, um, uh, melting glaciers, uh, and uh, that, uh, therefore, uh, we want to consult with them, find out what they want to do. And a very easy way to, to do that would be to uh, ask the OAS to organize a meeting on climate change, uh, where these things could be discussed. No need to have special preferences, if they're not worth it. Uh, that'll come later. Patience. And... Uh, it's a question of cumulative steps over time. But let me come back to the basic idea here. The idea is not to prefer neighbors over others, but you start with your neighbors who know you well and can read you well. And you perhaps can read them a little bit better than you can some other countries that are far off. Uh, I remember as a younger man worrying about Vietnam and thinking that Thank heavens, we weren't going to be uh, running into those kinds of problems uh, in Latin America because we had uh, language and other cultural interpretation built into our own society uh, that would be able to work. Uh, so it's just a question of taking seriously uh, the, the realities uh, of neighborhood and uh, Perhaps another word that has to be put in there uh, is the word dignity. Uh, 
treat others with dignity and with respect, and they will treat you with dignity and respect. Uh, and then from and then learn to listen, and from then we can move. Very true that. Very true indeed. A follow-up question from uh, Michelle Manat, who asks a good one. Is it not true that the lack of awareness and understanding, even at a basic level, of our hemisphere among the American citizenry uh, has limited political support in the United States for major programs or initiatives for the Americas? Uh, for example, it plays out in Congress where support is very uneven. Uh, what concrete things could the Department of State or other US government agencies do? And I think this is getting to the level of sort of domestic awareness. Are there things that, that from your experience you might recommend uh, we adopt or ways to be more engaged? What, what would you say about that? Well, uh, for one thing, we need, we need more Michelle Manats and we need more foreign service officers like you, Mark. Uh, the, the point being is we need more people who are willing to give of themselves um, to, um, uh, to inform uh, and to educate. And uh, I think I remember specifically Michelle um, helping um, that when she was uh, in the State Department uh, to uh, communicate with Congress and to uh, get some congressional uh, support for the Peru-Ecuador negotiations, uh, or uh, later when uh, I attempted to um, raise awareness of the need to try to at least extend uh, laws similar to our existing gun laws uh, to our um, regional cooperation. Um, yes, uh, clearly not knowing uh, what uh, the neighborhood is like uh, limits what one can do uh, to deal with it. Uh, but again, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge a little bit similar to what I, I think I see in the minds of the current administration as it attempts to deal with the question of, uh, of um, inequality and race and other issues here in the United States. Uh, make it part of the theme that you have to deal with every day. Just be aware of the issues. Ask yourself um, what matters. And um, I think that uh, that is it's a major limit and politicians can't really, we have also learned, we can't go beyond the level of public opinion, consciousness and so forth. We have to work with what we've got. Um, but uh, be aware that that's what you need to do, and um, and pay attention to that, and uh, and try to uh, try to work it. Um, State Department, for example, and this is a, this is a long issue. Uh, State has suffered for years from lack of funding and lack of education for its own people. Uh, we do not have the personnel or the backing that, for example, the military have, can't train our people, um, can't do things. I look forward to the day when maybe there will, the Foreign Service Institute, um, where you're now sitting, Mark, I think, um, uh, will have more funding and will also be able to in invite some of our neighbors' diplomats to study with us so that we can begin to develop people who know each other and understand each other's interests and limitations, be able to organize better. Um, all of these are things that need to be worked on uh, with patience over time, but none of them are insoluble. Just one follow-up question, a good one from uh, Lori Fitzpigato along those lines. The Biden administration, just looking forward, is, uh, trying to put together the most diverse uh, slate of, of diplomats and, and colleagues throughout the U.S. government that there's been, how should domestic issues, to stay on that topic, uh, made apparent in the United States throughout uh, the last year? Uh, we, uh, an insurrection, we saw the uh, disparities reflected in COVID uh, deaths, uh, racism, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, all of those. How, how should those be applied to changes in our foreign policy? If you could elaborate a bit more as to how you see that. Hmm. Well, uh, I'm glad that 
Lori is, uh, is listening, I welcome the question. Um, <laughs> maybe, well, uh, no, I, I think, uh, you know, the world has always known that the U.S. had a million problems. Um, uh, the, the key was that in the U.S. those problems were um, a something to be, that could be fought about, could be improved, could be worked on. Uh, we sweat too, uh, but at least uh, in the U.S., uh, we're able to keep the product of our sweat, um, to put it in a simple way, rather than have it uh, taken away from us uh, by uh, landowners or extortioners. Um, that was the basis of the American dream, um, that you would be able to earn the reward of your, for your work. And it is true. Um, the bloom is off the rose, uh, off that dream um, for the United States. Uh, but notice something. Uh, the world is still uh, voting with its feet. We still are under pressure um, for immigration. Uh, and we still fortunately have a, uh, a relatively um, uh, open country. Um, I, I think that um, the, what we need uh, is to accept that, first of all, that on this question of migration, immigration, we need a comprehensive migration reform. We need to have rules that we can then follow. It's amazing. In the business world, everybody knows that they need rules so that they can sell things and what the taxes are gonna be, what they're gonna pay. Predictability is fundamental. In the political and human world, we seem to have forgotten that rules really matter. So uh, one thing that we might do, uh, one thing we might ask our Senate to do, uh, if it ever gets itself untracked, is to start ratifying international treaties because the world can see that the fact that we have failed to ratify treaties for years is a sign that we really are not taking world order very seriously and that really in a funny way we're misinterpreting ourselves, thinking that we can bully our way to the top of any situation. I hope we're learning that we can't. Uh, so once again, humility, uh, respect, hard work, and uh, obey the law. Very good. We, we did get a, a question in from a uh, former senior State Department legal advisor, Michael Pay. So I, I did wanna share that with you. Uh, he's saying with regard, he's looking backwards a bit, with regard to your critical role in helping to negotiate a final resolution of the long simmering Peru-Ecuador territorial dispute, can you comment on how your innovative resolution of that uh, final square mile of disputed territory has ah. fared in practice, in practice between those two states? Looking back now on it, uh, how do you see it today having played out? Well, I'm going to be practical to begin with instead of theoretical. Uh, we would never have had a solution without it. Um, Ecuador had buried its dead in soil that turned out to be Peruvian. Uh, and nothing is more important than the blood of your people. Um, and uh, there was no way, uh, that was a deal killer, a true, true deal killer. And it took innovative, hats off to um, the legal question, it took innovative legal mind to figure out the solution. The solution is very simple. Um, that square kilometer, was Peruvian territory under Peruvian sovereign law, but it was Ecuadorian property with two special provisions, one of which was that Peru could not expropriate it 
and Ecuador could not sell it. That, in other words, it was there to be Ecuadorian property for a monument to the fallen and the grave of the dead, um, Ecuador's and the military's dignity was preserved while Peru's prop, uh, sovereignty was respected. Uh, and that um, prevented it from being a deal breaker. Um, and, you know, I uh, was sensitive to that issue and worked very hard to be one of those who came up with the idea um, because uh, it was a Venezuelan president, actually, who waved his fist, his arm at me, saying, as long as there is blood in this arm, I will defend Venezuela. I'm not sure what, what the uh, uh, thing followed, but it's that, it's the, it's the belief in or as a Peruvian, former Peruvian president had said to me when I first started feeling out to see whether things would be, what could be done uh, to solve the thing. He told me, well, President Fujimori uh, of Peru, our president has never buried his own in our land. So how can he be expected to defend our sovereignty and our rights? The question of, um, of, of, that's fundamental, and that's why that's why sovereignty is so easy to transform into bad vitamins or vitamins for bad politicians. Uh, that's why it's important for our political discourse to be aware that nationalism is one thing, but nationalism is dangerous. Think of patriotism as something that you want to uh, be proud of. Uh, not nationalism, not spitting at the other, but believing in oneself. There are a number of, uh, and you'll see in the comments uh, when we finish, a number of well wishes from former colleagues and employees and friends who've written. Uh, this one came from uh, someone who was with you at the OAS, from Berta. Uh, she writes, ¿Cómo ve usted una posibilidad de apoyo a Haiti? Uh, so in, in Haiti, uh, given that uh, there seems to always be sort of backtracking, despite all of the, the help from OAS countries, how do you see Haiti and, and, and a way forward? Well, not only did I spend a significant amount of my own life trying to work with Haitians and with Haiti, um, and the major effort some 30 or 40 trips to Haiti came after Peru, Ecuador. So after I thought I knew something about negotiations. Um, and since then, uh, my deputy, my chief of staff, um, the marvelous Trinidadian ambassador, Sandra Honoré, chief of staff at the OAS, uh, she then, uh, after serving for a while, various places as Trinidad's ambassador, she became the UN Secretary General's representative for Haiti. Uh, and I went back to Haiti um, when she was there and uh, once again looked at what, what we were trying to do and should be doing and so forth. I am, Haiti is, uh, was damned by nature uh, with this earthquake, uh, the 2010 earthquake, because they were beginning to claw back. Um, and there was some institutional development. Uh, and I think that the Haitian state needs to be supported. But in the midst of all of this, I have been very depressed by us, um, as well as by the fragmentations in Haiti. Um, I think there's been a tendency for the outside aid uh, to be managed by outsiders um, so that you go to a supermarket in Haiti and the only black person you'd see would be the driver in the SUV idling in the parking lot uh, while all the whiteies are inside doing their shopping. 
Um, I feel that, um, therefore, somehow there has to be a stock taking um, among the international community uh, and among the Haitians. Among the international community, uh, we must realize that instead of uh, using our foreign aid money to bring bottled water from Haiti, it would be better to simply build a bottling plant in Haiti uh, and let the Haitians do the work, not uh, imported Americans or Frenchmen uh, or Canadians. Um, and as far as the Haitians are concerned, uh, uh, let's avoid exile. Uh, I am very pleased that former President Aristide, who did not do a good job as president, but that he is still back now in Haiti, living there. Uh, I think Haitians need to reconcile with each other uh, and the international community has to support them, not itself. Uh, and then maybe uh, we will do a bit, uh, a bit better. Um, I also think I should put in a plug, the question came from an OAS source for the OAS uh, in this sense. Um, bilateral assistance is obviously very important, particularly if it is the richest country in the world that is providing it. The United States uh, likes to provide its own aid, as I say, too often with its own tied uh, interests. I think it is useful if more of that aid uh, could be sent, used multilaterally, uh, so that in fact, um, the uh, recipients uh, can actually use it without feeling indebted to any one particular country. Uh, I know that as an American, um, that's a hard thing to say because uh, I like to get credit for what we do. Uh, and uh, I hate to see uh, that credit uh, get spread around. Uh, but if we were to realize that we too are part of the OAS, that we too are part of the UN, and that that means that what the OAS does or what the UN does is really part of what we are doing, then maybe we might feel and understand better uh, how to deal with some of these situations. Uh, it is good to get our fingerprints off things sometimes. Absolutely. Well, I see we're just about out of time. There was one final, uh, maybe as a final uh, word from you, are there anything lingering, any particular successes or failures of U.S. policies toward Latin America that, that have lessons for us that you'd like to highlight now? I mean, after all, we're we're a history-based uh, organization. Uh, anything, uh, final thoughts that stick out on that? I, I think uh, really we I commented about bilateralism and multilateralism. Uh, please do not undervalue multilateralism. Uh, uh, President Carter used the OAS to sign the bilateral. Panama Canal treaties because he and we wanted everyone to be witnesses to the modern relationships we were developing with Panama. And it was for us, it was a guarantee against some colonel closing a lock for a birthday party for his daughter. Uh, and for the uh, Panamanians, it was a guarantee against the United States uh, suddenly trying to take over the canal again. Uh, so multilateralism in the form of witness uh, can be extraordinarily important. And I think that was the principle that um, uh, President Bush was applying when he signed uh, NAFTA uh, with Mexico and Canada uh, at the OAS. Uh, I think similarly, um, we should realize that there are times when the multilateral can actually 
uh, reduce the U.S. profile to the point of making it a success. I'm thinking of the 1990 elections, which uh, put the Sandinistas out of power in Nicaragua, um, where the OAS observation proved critical. We were very unhappy about the OAS being in bed with the Nicaraguan uh, Electoral Council and not having U.S. citizens as observers because they felt the U.S. citizens uh, would be a target of trouble. But what happened as a result is that the Sandinistas had no excuse when they actually lost the election. Uh, and the OAS was there to prove it. Uh, and uh, we were the beneficiaries. Uh, and of course, the OAS had done this because we supported them anyway. Uh, so there are uh, there is a basic lesson here. Uh, bring other people in. Use their wisdom and their skills. Um, we are not the only ones who can do things. Um, and, um, well, that's the basic lesson, please, um, that I wanted to give and leave with everybody. Um, the, the one word... Uh, that uh, summarizes everything, I think, or two words, I'll say, respect for others and their rights and listen to them so that you can find ways in which our interests can be advanced in ways that are compatible with theirs. Wise words indeed. Thank you for that. And really on behalf of ADST, uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, for sharing, uh, you know, these relevant insights. I think it's of importance and it's, it's our hope that this type of conversation serves as a useful resource for students of history, diplomatic practitioners, academics, policymakers. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, if you value history and the lessons it has and appreciate ADST's thank you collection. Thank you very much. Please join us at ADST.org. Learn how you can help support us. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.